Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nigel Brown. Uh, I'm the senior vice principal. I bring apologies from the principal who was supposed to chair um, at this inaugural lecture, uh, and also from the head of college, Professor Leslie Yellowlees, who was the second chair, so I'm third choice. They had much less important things to do, like uh, meeting UK science ministers. Uh, we've got the much more important job uh, this evening of uh, uh, attending uh, Alex uh, Simpson's lecture uh, on as his inaugural lecture as chair in foundations of computer science. So a little bit about uh, Alex as, a, as an academic and as a person. Following his undergraduate degree in, in mathematics at Oxford, um, he spent the rest of his career basically at Edinburgh, uh, firstly doing a master's in artificial intelligence, then a PhD in computer science, and then he's held positions as lecturer and reader, and he was promoted to his chair in uh, 2010. So it's taken, you know, getting on for two years to get him up in front of you, which is far too slow. Um, he's held EPSRC, postdoctoral and advanced research fellowships. He's a research consultant with uh, uh, Trento, he has been, and he's held visiting positions at Utrecht, Kyoto, and the University of Ljubljana. And so that scientific connection to Slovenia is uh, echoed by his uh, familial connection. Uh, his wife, uh, uh, Petra, is uh, uh, Slovenian, and his two daughters, uh, Kaya and Leah, have dual nationality. Uh, Kaya and Petra are with us. Uh, Leah, at the age of three, might be a little bit young to sit through a lecture on mathematics and computer science, but she'll join us later, I understand. So it's also a pleasure to welcome here this evening Alex's uh, uh, parents, and we're honored to have uh, uh, Mrs. Anna Wilson, the honorary uh, Consul General of the Slovenian Consulate uh, in Edinburgh, welcome. Now, in addition to his high academic attainment, uh, Alex is a man of wide-ranging interests, I'm told. He's uh, known to his friends as someone who's impressively knowledgeable, I'm told, in physics, philosophy, music, and literature. And he's also, and still is, a keen hill walker. And he was a serious rock climber as well. He has 100 Munros for his credit, and as an undergraduate, uh, spent a lot of time coming from Oxford up to Sky uh, to indulge in his passion for rock climbing. But nowadays, I suppose his uh, family responsibilities have reduced his risk-taking as befits a sensible and thoughtful uh, individual. So I'm very pleased to welcome um, Alex to give his inaugural lecture, and I invite him uh, as uh, professor and personal chair in the Foundations of Computer Science to give his inaugural lecture, The Intertwined Foundations of Mathematics and Computer Science. Alex. Well, thank you, Nigel, for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to everyone who's come here today, especially those who have travelled far to be here. Um, before starting, I'd briefly like to single out a few individuals for um, special thanks. So firstly, Marjorie Dunlop, um, who was responsible for... who's, who's done all the organisation for today, so I haven't had to do anything, so thanks very much, Marjorie. Someone who isn't in the lecture, Areti Manataki, is not here solely because she's looking after our three-year-old daughter, Leah, upstairs. So thank you very much, Areti, for taking that job on. My wife, Petra, has been a tremendous source of um, support over the past 10 years, not to mention over the past couple of weeks, while I've been juggling first-year exam marking with the preparation of this lecture. So thank you very much. And our two children, Kaya and Leah, are, of course, um, uh, continual sources, of, unwavering, uh, continual sources of, of immense happiness. As Nigel said, both my parents are here, so thank you very much for your support throughout my life. And um, lastly, I'd like to say a few words about Petra's parents, who have also been a huge support and inspiration. Um, Petra's mother passed away two years ago in, after a long illness, uh, very tragically. So I'd like to express my enormous appreciation of her and of Petra's father, who also can't be here today, um, for everything they've, they've done for us. 
Okay, so thank you everyone, and over to the lecture. And uh, I wasn't really sure what to talk about, when, um, which isn't the only reason for the delay of two years. I'll say more about the, re the reason for the delay of two years later. Um, so one idea was to give, try to give an overview of my research interests, but I thought that would be quite difficult. So instead I decided to focus on just one topic, essentially, that's of interest to me. Um, it's not going to be that much about my own research in the talk, but anyway, I thought this would be a nice topic to talk about, or at least to try to talk about to a general audience. And the first thing to address with the general audience is, well, what is computer science? Because um, computer science is, well, it occupies a rather uneasy place amongst sciences. It's a very young science compared with the other sciences. And it's not about nature. It's not about space. So it's not a natural science. And it also has rather a low public profile. So if you go to a bookshop and browse the popular science books, you won't find, you will find some, but you won't find many books on computer science. So a lot of people don't really have much of an idea what computer scientists do. So what do we, broadly speaking, computer scientists do in general? Well, my own summary is that computer science provides the modeling methods, analytic tools, and implementation methodologies that can be taken on board when engineering the hugely complex computer systems that are nowadays part of our everyday experience. So we have the so we have the um, computer science having it as the tool that provides the methodology that, um, that feeds into computer practice. So this, this much is, of course, um, uncontroversial. But in creating and applying the, the tools that one needs to apply in computer science, one often needs to use rigorous analytic or calculational methods. And these are, of course, provided by mathematics. So we have mathematics feeding into computer science, feeding into computer practice. And uh, the UK research councils refer to this as the, the mathematics is, the, is what's called the upstream from computer science, the theoretical upstream. We've got a flow of ideas from theory into practice and computer practice is the downstream. And it's a nice, convenient model in which theoretical ideas are being somehow shaped by computer science and put into practice so that, in the end, one ultimately achieves the politically desirable effect of um, stimulating the economy, that is, um, that is making money. <laughs> However, this model, I think, has a, a problem with it, um, especially in how it's used, in that it's very compartmentalized. Uh, at least it's used in a compartmentalized way. In particular, there's an area of mathematical work that's used in computer science, which if one has a narrow-minded view of mathematics, you would say is not mathematics. And if you have a, a narrow-minded view of computer science, you would say, is not computer science. So where is it? Well, in, in some sense, it's the no man's land between mathematics and computer science. And that is the subject of my talk today, to introduce you to this no man's land and hopefully try to uh, convey some idea of what it's like to be doing research in this area. But I should say the no man's land terminology is not really appropriate, because if you have a broad view of mathematics, then it is mathematics. And if you have a broad view of computer science, then it is computer science. And probably, we're, I'm, I have the pleasure of addressing, I hope, a broad-minded audience today. <laughs> so as I said, this is an oversimplistic picture. And the reason it's oversimplistic is we have this no man's land. And I, I decided to follow an oversimplistic picture with an oversimplistic slide. So computer science, I say, produces new mathematical areas. I'm not going to go through them and list them. And this is just 
some new mathematical areas that are studied in computer science. It's oversimplistic in that these are, not all these areas were really produced by computer science. So some people in the know will know that the first two, computability theory and automata theory, um, actually arose in mathematical logic, and temporal logic that's down here actually arose in philosophy and linguistics. But nowadays, these subjects are active areas of research within the community that's doing mathematics for the purpose of computer science. So rather than in the previous simplistic picture of applying existing mathematical theories to computer science, there's a whole enterprise of developing new mathematics that is relevant to the purpose of doing computer science. And this, these topics, I think it's fair to say, this is what is collectively normally referred to as foundations of computer science. These mathematical topics that have arisen essentially through the need to do computer science. And I think they're very comparable in, in, in where they stand in, the, in our intellectual world, in some sense, with the traditional mathematical areas such as geometry, algebra, um, probability theory, number theory, just again, there's a non-exhaustive list of mathematical areas there. But of course, they're much younger subjects. These traditional mathematical subjects have been around for centuries, most of them, not all of them. Um, computer science has only been around for about half a century. And of course, there's a difference in style in that the mathematical topics of computer science are not focused on issues so much as number and space that are the subject matter of ordinary mathematics, but rather focused on modeling computation and being able to do things with computation, about which we'll say a little bit more later. So I've told you what the foundations of computer science is, in my view. It's the, these mathematical areas that, have been, that are essentially being developed for applications in computer science. The foundations of maths is used in a rather different way. So the fact is that all the mathematical theories I've mentioned, the ones on the previous slide, the traditional mathematical theories, and also the ones, the new mathematical theories, which I've dubbed the foundations of computer science, can be developed within a single mathematical theory. They can all be reduced, and I think the, maybe the best word is encoded in, a single mathematical theory called set theory, which is amongst mathematicians, broadly speaking, generally accepted as what people call the foundation of mathematics. And what set theory provides is a language that's rich enough to define all mathematical concepts, um, some axioms, which are supposedly stating evident properties that we use as the basis for our deductions, and a logic that we use to make the deductions. And with all these three things combined together, we have set theory within which, in practice, all of mathematics can be encoded. So roughly speaking, we've got this. So drawing has never been my forte. Um, but roughly speaking, we've, we've got this picture where we've got Mathematics and the foundations of computer science, that's the mathematical subjects being developed for computer science, sitting more or less side by side as both, math both collections of mathematical subjects that can be reduced to the same core, that is the same foundational theory, that set theory which is sitting on the bottom. The size here, this is the, the mathematics is large to represent, that's a huge subject compared with foundations of computer science. The size of set theory is unreasonably large here. It's by no means that size in comparison with mathematics. It's quite small as a subject and, um, relative to the whole of mathematics. I just made it that large so it could sit under everything else. And I put computer science on top of the foundations of computer science. Strictly speaking, it's really founded just as much. It's balanced on top of mathematics, traditional mathematics, as well as computer science, as are all the other sciences. So all the, all the sciences live on top of mathematics, but computer science lives also on top of the foundations of computer science. And the thesis of this talk, so this talk is going to have a thesis that I'm going to try to persuade you of, which is my own personal belief. Um, the first part here is uncontroversial amongst basically all mathematicians who know enough about the subject, which is that set theory, it's the, the generally accepted foundation of mathematics, and there's a particular axiomatization, which is the, the gold standard of mathematics in a, in a sense, um, 
I might explain that later, we'll see. Um, so it's not set in stone as the only possible foundation of mathematics. There are other foundations one can have for mathematics. But people tend not to, because mathematicians tend to, well, they can reduce their subjects to set theory. Once they've done that, well, they know that the theories they're developing have a, a solid basis. They can be derived on the basis of the generally accepted axioms. After that, they, they can pretty much ignore set theory because it's not relevant to the practice of continuing with their math, of developing their mathematical theories. What I'm going to show you today is that in computer science, sometimes it turns out that issues within the foundations of mathematics to do with set theory are relevant to the practice of doing the theoretical computer science, somewhat surprisingly. And sometimes it's useful and occasionally it's even essential to vary the foundations of mathematics, to change the foundations of mathematics in order to let us develop the mathematical theories we need to develop for computer science. So the foundational theories of computer science provide reasons for considering these variations in the subject of, of, of the foundations of mathematics, variations on set theory. And um, more speculatively, and this will just be the very last bit of the talk, I think there is more scope than is um, accepted in the mathematical communities for the development for uh, such variations also being used in the development of some aspects of mathematics. And I'll talk about that right at the very end. Okay, so I decided to do the talk like this that most of it is going to be just one example. And that example is going to be based not on my own work, but on the work of one of my PhD students. So this gives me appropriate time to thank my PhD students. I've, I've um, had six of them. Two of them, James and Ingo, are in the audience. This is in chronological order. And the last one, Matteo Mio, um, is the one whose work I'm going to talk about with his permission. So this is Matteo, he's Italian, and that's him, I believe, in Piazza San Marco in, in Venice. So one thing, so PhD students, I've, I find it a tremendously rewarding supervising PhD students, but it's never easy. And um, it was never less easy than with Matteo. He was a very gifted student, but from talking to him in his first year here, um, we decided that we were both interested in pursuing a direction that was a little bit daring in the sense that it's not so connected to my, the mainstream of my research, but we had an idea for how we might address it. So we thought we would pursue this slightly bold direction, not in the mainstream of my usual research interests, which was to provide a method for verifying what one might call, or what are often called, concurrent probabilistic systems. So here, a, pro a concurrent system is one with lots of components working in parallel, and the probabilistic means you're taking into account, for example, some probabilities of, for example, a component failing. We want to verify properties of this, and the sort of example that people consider and often present in lectures is something like this. Your concurrent system is something very complex, like the control system for a nuclear power station. And you want to verify the property that there's a probability of less than a million that you will enter meltdown in the, the near future. Now, that's such an example is good for illustrating the general idea, but of course there would, there's no chance that you would ever be able to accurately enough model a system that you would able, be able to express such a property and prove such a property of a system. So what sort of thing can one realistically prove. So here's an example of a, a very simple system which will illustrate the kinds of consideration we have in mind. So here the system, you can think of it biologically if you like, or you can think of it also as just a collection of n, some number of antagonistic agents that are doing some harm, um, that are all collected together in, into a cluster. And what happens, the way the system evolves according to this particular model, is that time is ticking, and at every time step, one of these viruses, virus cells as I'm, called them, as I'm calling them, is selected, and with probability p, it dies, it goes to nothing, and with probability 1 minus p, it 
duplicates itself instead. Of course, you don't want it to duplicate itself, so you want to express, you want to show some nice property of the system such that the cluster eventually dies out. And this is how one would express this property in the logic that for expressing properties that Matteo um, was considering when he was doing this project, which is called the probabilistic new calculus. So we want to show that this system eventually dies out. Now in this case, it's actually mathematically simple because this reduces to what mathematicians call a random walk and the, the, the system dies out with probability one if and only if the value of the probability of dying is greater than or equal to one half. So it's perfectly analyzable, this system. But the general property of showing that a system like this satisfies a property expressed in this language is very hard. But we had an idea for developing a way of doing this. And this was the project that Matteo and I agreed in his first year that he might do for his PhD. And one thing that's particularly hard about this kind of system is that actually the a priori, the number of virus cells you might get is unbounded. So it's what's called an infinite state system. So you can't just computationally analyze the whole state space to explore it to see whether the property is going to hold or not. You have to produce some more analytic methods. Anyway, so Matteo worked on this for two and a half years. And I'm afraid to say the task was very difficult. He did make progress, but it was very, very slow. But at the end of two and a half years, he'd written a paper for um, a, a workshop, which was accepted, and he basically had enough material for a PhD thesis, but it was kind of complicated and not as nice as what we'd originally been imagining. And um, he was a very good student. I a little bit felt guilty that I'd given him this topic to work on and um, that it hadn't gone as well as we were expecting. But then, in May 2010, he stunned me with, with two totally unexpected um, breakthroughs. And that was that firstly he came to my office and he told me he'd solved an open problem, which wasn't a very, so an open problem is a question in mathematics, in this case in the foundations of computer science that no one's been able to answer before. This was, uh, it was an open problem in the sense it had been stated in a paper about 10 years before. It wasn't an especially well-known one, but nonetheless it was there in the literature and he had a solution to it. And he quickly convinced me that his solution worked and it was very easy what to do with this. It was a short thing. He submitted it to a workshop that was um, in this area and it's it got accepted and has now recently been published or accepted for publication in a journal. So that was easy to deal with. But the second breakthrough was that he came up with a way of generalizing this with um, what was a, a highly novel and ambitious proposal for extending his logic and the semantics that he was dealing with, the game theoretic semantics, with a new operation called independent, which he called independent product which was useful for, because it had expressive powers. It would allow us to express things we couldn't express before in the logic. Now, the problem with this was he was already two and a half years into his PhD. PhDs are supposed to last three years. This is not an advisable time to change the course of, of your PhD. And um, all guidelines for supervisors say, and students say, don't do this. But on the other hand, when I did my PhD, I also changed my topic in the third year. So I was not totally adverse to the idea. And he was, I thought this was a stunning and original idea that he had. The, the proof sketch he had was convincing and it was clearly not going to be trivial work. So what to do? Well, we decided that, um, we decided that he, it, this was now June 2010. I was going on holiday in July. He was on holiday in August. <laughs> I was then going on sabbatical for a year in Slovenia starting from September, which is the reason I didn't give my inaugural last year, just to, <coughs> just to, just to make that point. Um, so he was burning, he was itching to investigate this. So what I said to him was, well, you work on this over the summer. We'll meet again in September and see how you've got on. There's a conference that this, if you manage to work this out, that this would naturally go to. So let's see if you can get it to go. Otherwise, we'll go back to the original plan together with the solution to the open question, so it's a little better than the original plan, um, and write that up, even though that would be a bit demoralizing. But anyway, it would at least be a, a PhD thesis. 
So I was encouraged and I agreed to him spending the summer fleshing out the details of two. So we had our holidays, flash forward to I was on sabbatical in Ljubljana, um, visiting my colleague and friend Andre Bauer at the Faculty for Mathematics and Physics. Um, and then Matteo came to, to visit and he'd sent me a draft of what he'd done beforehand and I'd looked through it and uh, it looked quite good. I had some questions on it and I, when he arrived I said, well, you, how are you getting on? And he said, well, I, I think everything works. I, I didn't check the one thing you told me not to worry about, but apart from that, um, I think everything works. So we spent the whole day on this nice sunny day, 16th of September, um, in, the, in front of the blackboard, actually whiteboard, in, in the coffee room in, in Ljubljana. Um, there was something I wasn't particularly convinced by, so we went to a cafe and we um, worked it out in detail over a paper and we got a plan and he agreed that he was going to work on that that evening and we thought that if he follow, followed that plan we would, he would have a solution to that. So I left him at his hotel and we were both feeling really elated that the summer plan had worked. But of course, as you would have picked up on, there was this one niggle of the thing I told him not to worry about. So I left him at his hotel and I thought, I better think about that one thing, which is true, I told him not to worry about in June. So I thought, started thinking about it, and before I had reached the corner of the street, I realised there was a problem. So unfortunately, there was a critical gap in the work to do with the issue I told him not to worry about. So to explain what the critical gap was, at some level of detail for a general audience, I need to tell you a little bit about set theory, the foundation of mathematics. This is the father of set theory, Georg Cantor, um, and he developed a theory of what are called cardinalities, which is the, the study of, well, the subject of infinite numbers. Now, People, including my daughter Kaya, who is immersed in a book there, but um, even children are very interested in the concept of infinity. You're very familiar with the situation. You count the numbers and you never get to the end, so you have infinitely many numbers. And Cantor asked the very nice question, can you count the real numbers? Now, the real numbers are the numbers that measure the position, you, the, the distance along a line. Um, so can you count the real numbers? I don't, nobody had asked this question before Cantor. So I'm going to actually give a mathematical proof in the lecture of which is Cantor's answer to this question. I apologize to the, probably the majority of people that have seen this before, but my daughter Kaya, who's in the front row here, who's seven years old, has not seen this proof before. So it is <laughs> aimed at least for her. <laughs> and maybe there is somebody else who hasn't seen this, this proof before. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate. In, in a sense, I'm going to say, yes, I can count the real numbers. And, I'm going to, and Cantor is going to prove that I didn't manage to do it. So here, I'm actually only going to count the real numbers between 0 and 1. But anyway, there are fewer of those than the full real numbers. So if I can't count those, then there's no hope of me counting all the real numbers. We'll see. But I'm going to try to count the, the real numbers. So here's my first real number. Now, as people will hopefully know, to give a real number, you have to give infinitely many decimal digits. And I was fascinated by this as a child. I memorized the decimal expansion of pi to more than 50 places when I was about 10 years old, I think. And then I got wise enough to realizing that I was wasting my time. <laughs> it was a bit, I was, perhaps I was hoping to spot a pattern, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. Anyway, um, anyway, you need to give infinitely many decimal digits. So here's my first list, of, and here's the second list of infinitely many digits. Of course, I'm um, not putting them all on the slide. And here's the third one, but I'm applying a very cunning strategy here because I'm trying to exhaust all the real numbers in doing this. I'm not going to tell you what my strategy is, but I'm being very systematic so that I don't miss out any of the real numbers. So there's the fourth one, uh, the fifth one, the sixth one, the seventh one, uh, and so on. Again, I won't carry on forever. But now what Cantor does is, well, Cantor says, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the highlighted red digits here. That's the first digit of the first, the first decimal digit of the first number, the second decimal digit of the second number, the third decimal digit of the third number, and so on, and write them out as a number here. 
This is called the diagonal because you're going down the diagonal of the square of numbers here. And now all you need to do, modulo a minor technicality that I won't mention, is change these digits because if you do, if you change every digit, then it can't be the first number because it differs from the first number on the first digit. It can't be the second number because it differs from the second number on the second digit. So let me give you, I've changed the digits by adding two to each digit and sort of wrapping round from nine to zero. So this can't be the first number because it's nine in the first digit, whereas that was seven. This can't be the second number because it's one in the second digit, whereas the second number was nine, and so on. It can't be any of the numbers by this method. So Cantor answered his own question, no, we can't count the real numbers. Okay, so as I said, I apologize to those of the many of you who've seen this argument before, but I thought it would be a nice idea to try and get one mathematical proof in a public lecture. Um, so then Cantor had the bold idea of pushing this further and saying, well, so we've got different sizes of infinities. We've got those we can count at least, and those, those we can count and those we can't count. So let's have a system of numbers for measuring these sizes of sets. So a system of numbers are called cardinal numbers, and they generalize the, the usual numbers. So for the, um, for, for example, the set that just has five elements, its cardinality is five, so we're just counting the size of the set. But for a countable set, like the countably infinite set, like the set of um, natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, well, there are countably infinitely many of these. So he introduced a symbol called a number, an infinite number called Aleph zero to count the size of this set. So just for those of you who are um, a bit bewildered by this idea, you might then say, well, what about a, a smaller set like this, the prime numbers? Well, Euclid showed us that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So what would be the number of those? That This is clearly a smaller set because it doesn't have all the natural numbers in. Nonetheless, we can count our way through it and we can put the, this set in one to, what's called one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of numbers. So it basically counts as having the same size. So this also has its cardinality, its size is also Aleph zero. So what about the real numbers? Well, this can't be Aleph zero because Aleph zero is the number for the countable infinities. And this is, we've seen this is not a countable infinity. So what's the number for that? Well, another of Cantor's great advances was he was a very original thinker was he showed that there is a smallest uncountable cardinality called Aleph 1. And it would be beyond the possibilities of this talk to explain to you what Aleph 1 looks like, but it is there. It's the smallest uncountable cardinality. So is the size of the real numbers Aleph 1? Well, we'll return to that question. But what Cantor could show is that these numbers also have support nice arithmetic operations. You can generalize the usual arithmetic operations of addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. That's taking one number to the power of another to these cardinalities. And he showed that the size of the continuum, as it's called, the, the set of real numbers, is two to the Aleph zero. And clearly that's at least as big as the smallest uncountable cardinality. But the question is, which he raised, and he believed it to be true, is it the same as the smallest uncountable cardinality? So are there any subsets of the real numbers that are not countable but don't have the same cardinality of the set of the real numbers? And he conjectured not, and he called this the continuum hypothesis, and he was actually very disturbed in his life that he couldn't prove the continuum hypothesis. A lot of other people at the time said, well, what is all this abstract stuff about infinite numbers? This has nothing to do with real mathematics, about which we'll return to um, a little bit later. But he had very strong support from one of the most influential mathematicians at the time, David Hilbert, who was so impressed by the theory that Hilbert put it first on a very influential list of open problems of, that shaped the course of 20th century mathematics. Um, so this was a list of 23 open problems in mathematics at the turn of the 20th century, 1900. His, the problem, he said, was, is the continuum hypothesis true? Is it the case that the cardinality of the real numbers is this smallest uncountable cardinality? And no progress was made on this for a long time. And then the progress was not, perhaps, what people would normally expect in mathematics. Um, so the first progress was Kurt Gödel, who's famous for his what are called his incompleteness theorems, showed that, well, he couldn't prove that the continuum hypothesis was true, but he could show that at least it was consistent. That is, 
If you assume it, you're not going to, it's not going to do you any harm. You're not going to derive a contradiction. But it was still an open question whether or not you could actually prove it, and it was shown to be not provable by Paul Cohen in 1963, so he showed that it's also consistent to assume the negation of the continuum, the continuum hypothesis. Now, what on earth does this have to do with computer science, you may be asking. So we'll see in a little while. I mean, certainly, most mathematicians believe that the continuum hypothesis is not really relevant to mathematics. I'll say a little bit more about that. And the world of set theory is considered to be a very abstract and baffling world that does not have much connection with real practical mathematics. And to emphasize somehow how bewildering and baffling it can be, I want to just mention one other result of set theory, which I also read about as a child and totally blew my mind at the time, which is something called the Barnard-Tarski theorem. So this is a theorem in mathematics, where mathematics means zamello frankel set theory with the axiom of choice, the, the standard foundation of mathematics, set theoretic foundation of mathematics that I talked about before. This says, given a solid ball, solid sphere, we can cut it into finitely many pieces. In fact, five pieces are enough. And reconfigure those pieces just by what are called tr translations. That's moving them around laterally and rotations. We're not changing their size at all. And put them back together to make two solid balls the same size as the original ball. It's absolutely preposterous. <laughs> uh, but it's a theorem of mathematics. And the, the reason it works is the, the pieces are something strange called non-measurable sets. And only measurable sets have a property like size or mass that you can talk about. So the fact that you're kind of duplicating the mass of a sphere, apparently, is not contradicted here because the pieces you use have no mass. But it's, it's still a preposterous statement. And it crucially uses this axiom called the, the axiom of choice. And the best way I can, my impression I can give of the kind of pieces that are used is that it's somehow like a sort of um, aerosol or something. It's just a smattering of, 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 of infinitesimally small points. But you can nonetheless reassemble them in this way. And what, what on earth can this have to do with practical mathematics? So people were a bit skeptical of abstract mathematics, of abstract set theory but after results like this. By people, I mean sort of practically minded mathematicians. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the mathematicians' perspective, they accept, this is kind of what I believe is the general perspective of the mathematical community, they accept that set theory provides a, an axiomatic basis on top of which practical mathematics is rigorously developed, and they will refer to it as the foundation, which, which is the basis justifying their, their, their developments rigorously. And this axiom of choice that we used to define this funny decomposition of these spheres, well, that does play a useful role in mathematicians. See it, it keeps the maths tidy in some sense. And it can be shown to, shown to do no harm. You can't get any real, con you, can't, you can't, any practical statement of mathematics that can be shown using choice can also be shown without it. So you've got a tidy mathematics that doesn't do any harm. The continuum hypothesis, this question of Cantor's that can either be assumed or its negation can be assumed, has no bearing on practical mathematics at all. And I held this belief for a very long time. Probably most people in the audience who know about the continuum hypothesis hold this belief. However, there is one practical subject, probability theory, where some of these issues creep in in a sense. Now, that's probability theory is a very practical subject. But the issues that I mentioned to do with this Barnard-Tarski theorem, the decomposing the balls about the existence of non-measurable sets, creep up there in the sense that probability theory is based on measure theory. It requires measurable set sets. And you need to go through quite a lot of mathematical um, contortions sometimes in order to, to, well, to, to the, the fact, I mean, the development of probability theory is very thoroughly worked out, but there are some complexities in it that are to do with issues that arise because of the existence of non-measurable sets. So some issues from set theory do arise sometimes in um, practical mathematical subjects. Anyway, let's return to our main story here. So we'll go, having done the detour through the foundations of mathematics, we're now going to return to Matteo 
And the critical gap was, well, I don't want to explain it in too much detail, but he needed to assign a probability to a certain event to do with his game theoretical models of this logic we had for expressing properties of concurrent systems. And he could do this by approximating the event by a sequence of simpler events. This is a standard technique, and he wanted to show that the probability of the approximated event was the limit of the probability of the approximation. So the approximations of the probability tended to the probability of the whole event. But the issue that I realized was a problem after I'd left him at his hotel was that the cardinality of the if the cardinality of the approximating sequence had been countable, it had been a countably infinite set of approximations, this would have been straightforward. But it was Aleph 1 instead, this smallest uncountable cardinality. Now I knew at the time, I knew a way, there was a, so this raises one, two issues in fact. One is just why does this set have a probability at all, but I knew a way around that. But the other one is why is that probability the limit of its approximating probabilities? And at the time, I didn't know a way around that. So actually that night, I think it was the 16th of September on the previous slide, um, I went to bed in Slovenia and I, I, I couldn't sleep. I, I had three thoughts, mathematical thoughts. One was that maybe we could use some very special properties of the situation in order to resolve the situation here. The second one was maybe there'd be a general solution, but I could see that any general solution would require the con assuming that the continuum hypothesis is false, because it's crucial to get a general solution that this cardinality here is different from the cardinality of the continuum. I can't explain why, but it is. I could see that we were impinging on the continuum hypothesis, and the other one was that although it seemed to me that all the work Matteo had done over the summer look, had looked fundamentally correct, perhaps this was just one of these problems that turns out to be um, like a bulge in the rug that no matter how you try to push it down, it moves somewhere else and you can never stamp it out. And so I was a bit concerned because we'd been so happy the day before that he'd apparently followed this program well over the summer, and suddenly everything looked like it was going to collapse. So the next morning, 17th of September, we went back to the maths department. And it was not a very good picture, but it was actually a very rainy day. There's somebody with an umbrella there that you can't see very well. Matteo came to the office. He was very bouncy. He had, that, you remember there was this issue that we'd, a minor issue with his proof that he was go, he'd been going to sort out the previous evening. He'd successfully done that. Now, the problem, I'm not very good at hiding my feelings, as people who know me will know. I didn't know what to say, and I just said, I'm very sorry, Matteo. We've got a serious problem. And I told him what it was, and uh, he looked crestfallen. And we, we were discussing that, and while we were discussing, something came to my memory that I should have realized the night before, but I had a sleepless night and it was, I was stressed. About something I'd read in set theory a long time ago, I said, excuse me, I just need to go off and look on Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> or Google. So, so I did, and so Matteo was there biting his nails, and as he, as he tells the story, 20 minutes later, I came back to his office clutching a book on set theory, um, Jack's standard text on set theory, and there, the solution was there, and I was, uh, I'm actually a bit embarrassed that I didn't know it already, because I thought I was reasonably well-read in set theory. And the solution was there. All we need to do, we can solve the problem by, firstly, as I realized, assuming that the continuum hypothesis is false, but that's a consistent thing to do. And secondly, adopting a, an axiom that's well-known in set theory called Martin's axiom that I can paraphrase only like this. Every cardinality smaller than 2 to the Aleph 0 behaves somewhat like Aleph zero. The, the, the continuum hypothesis needs to be false in order to get Aleph one to be one such cardinality. Then it's going to behave a little bit like Aleph zero, and that it behaves enough like Aleph zero for Matteo's proof to go through. So everything was solved. He wrote his paper for the conference. We were slightly worried about how this paper was going to be accept, uh, received by the conference because we didn't know any paper in computer science that used assumptions like the negation of the continuum hypothesis and Martin's axiom. <laughs> Actually, we got very, Matteo, it was Matteo's paper, he got very positive reviews. So it was accepted for the conference. It was a happy ending. Um, 
present, he presented it at FOSAX. It actually won the best student paper award for the whole um, suite of conferences at which that conference appeared. And uh, he wrote it all up in great detail in his uh, PhD thesis that was examined earlier this year, and he graduates this coming June. So a very happy ending for Matteo. A lot of ups and downs in the, in the course of the PhD. But before leaving this and going on to the next story, which is going to be a much shorter story, <laughs> I just want to think a little bit about, well, so okay, we got the paper accepted. But what have we actually achieved here? So what's been achieved? Well, so from a neutral perspective, I mean, what we've done, there's a main result here that's a mathematical theorem. But that theorem requires two non-standard axioms. I mean, they're standard amongst set theorists, but they're not part of the standard armory of mathematical axioms. And moreover, these, compared with the other axioms of set theory, which have a sort of intuitive justification, people put them forward as being evident principles of sets, these are not evident principles of sets <laughs> at all. So we can't really say that the result we've got, Matteo's result, is true. All we know is that it's consistent. So we've got a non-true theorem, but at least a consistent theorem. But because of general results about set theory, we know that any practical consequence we derive from it, such as the probability of a, a certain event that we've got a nice handle on being such and such a number, will indeed be true and provable by other means, not using this general machinery. So at least we've got that. So I think that there a reasonable summary is that We've not got mathematical truths here that can be, that, that a mathematician would accept as being truths, but nonetheless, the machinery he's developed is a consistent and safe mathematical framework for reasoning about his logic, his game theoretic semantics, which is the thing, the, the, the models of this logic that he was going to use for reasoning about these concurrent systems. Um, so it's a safe framework for reasoning about probability, probabilistic modal mu calculus, but then one asks a very natural question. Who would want to reason with the probabilistic mu calculus, mu calculus with independent product, this logic he's looking at? And the honest answer to that question is probably no one. <laughs> so nonetheless, has the research been worthwhile for something? Well, I think so. And th this is my take and motivating why I think it was worthwhile. So there is considerable practical interest in the community that's interested in verifying properties of probabilistic concurrent systems in using user-friendly logics, not this modal mu calculus, which is quite complicated in some, well, quite hard to understand, but more user-friendly logics that are easily express prop the properties that one want to express of concurrent probabilistic systems. Um, so what the probabilistic modal mu calculus gives you is a, a low-level logic a bit like a machine code into which these more user-friendly logics, which are a bit more like high-level programming languages, can be translated. Um, and the translation provides a, a mathematical decomposition of these, these high-level languages that's non-trivial. And it is plausible that this decomposition might actually be useful for use for, use for verification. But even if that doesn't transpire, it's also interesting the reduction of these more user-friendly logics, but which are in some sense less principled to this logic, which is in some ways a very principled logic. One can see it as a kind of reduction in a sort of Occam's razor style. So that is kind of how I see the practical side of this. But there's also a mathematical side of what we've achieved, which is that the techniques and the kind of games Matteo was using are really new and have aroused a little bit of interest, not very much yet, but anyway, that's a new direction in stochastic game theory. And I think there is some interest in opening up stochastic game theory is the subject that, it, that looks at the kinds of games he was looking at. And I think there is some interest in opening up sort of new mathematical perspectives. So I want to just say one other thing about this general motivation here. So I've said, I mean, this is what I think is an honest description of the, the practical Im import of this work. Um, so this is very far from what the funding councils would call a pathway to impact. So a pathway to impact means seeing how your research is ultimately in the future, going, or actually in the rather near future, in, in, indeed, going to um, benefit the economy of the United Kingdom. 
Um, so, well, still, I think it is of value. And I, so there is always, and there has been a long time, a tension between theoretical research and applied research. And uh, I, I always, always puzzles me why, is that, why there's this tension Why practical people tend to say, oh, that's too applied, I'm not interested. Or, whereas it's never the other way around. And it always seems to me, I mean, there should be more harmony between the subjects. And so one thing, I was struck by a phrase that I tidied my office two weeks ago for the first time since moving into the building four years ago. And um, I, I came across this which was the publicity brochure for the Istituto per la Ricerca Scientifica e Te Tecnologica from 1990 in Trento, where I started my research career, having finished my master's degree as an, as a, an M an MSc student in artificial intelligence here in Edinburgh. I went to work at the, in the um, mechanized reasoning group at this research institute in Trento. So um, here's my boss, Fausto Junquilio, who some people in the room will know. This is me, we're all sitting at our workstations. This is our group, I'll just, just in case people know them, we were working in automated reasoning. Um, these people are reasonably well known now, so just for people who know them, this is Alessandro Cimatti, Alessandro Armando, and Luciano Serafini. And um, from this brochure, this, this photo is from the brochure, but also from the um, introduction by the director of the, of the institute, there's this nice statement, the duality, basic research, applied research, defines the Cartesian axis of a forward-looking research strategy. So this was from a semi-industrial um, research institute, and even they were looking at both applied, at least at the time, applied and basic research. Um, so I just want to mention, I, mean, I think it's far enough removed that so the director of the institute, I think it's safe now to say, he had a ghostwriter, so this is not his own words, but his ghostwriter, I don't want to name him just in case he would be embarrassed at being named, he's a friend of mine, but he's, he's a professor, just so you know, he's a professor of philosophy at Columbia University nowadays. So <laughs> maybe that explains the formulation of the sentence. But anyway, I believe, I, I really believe in, in this statement. There's not much else in the publicity brochure that I believe in, but, <laughs> but, I, do, but I do believe in this. So anyway, we were at research, I was working in mechanized reasoning, but I had a hobby at the time. Um, in fact, one might call it an obsession, um, which is, as an MSc student, my flatmate had introduced me to the lambda calculus. And I'd become very, very interested in this, uh, in this topic. It's the world's simplest programming language, so it's so simple that it's unreadable. If, whoops. Um, unless you know it, it just has very terse notation like this. And this is the very useful program that just goes into a loop and never does anything, for, for those who know. But nonetheless, one can write all sorts of programs. This language is Turing complete. And I was just struck by its elegance and um, by the fact that is mathematically it was a very simple idea, that a simple mathematical model would just be given by having a set that is, whoops, sorry, that is its own function space to, to itself. So, unfortunately, there are no such models. And I read, when I was an MSc student, my um, flatmate loaned me a, a, a quite simple introductory book to the Lambda Calculus, and it showed that there are some quite, there are various complicated models one can make from the lambda for, for the Lambda Calculus, because you can't get this simple set theoretic model. But when I got to Trento, Fausto, much to my delight, on his bookshelf, had the Bible of the Lambda Calculus, which is this book by Barendrecht. So I borrowed this book. I wasn't reading this during the day because we were working on mechanized reasoning, reasoning during the day. So I read this book avidly at night. I took it to the beach when I, when I went to the seaside. And I was, didn't realize at the time, this is such a well-written book. I didn't have much experience in mathematical books. I don't think I've found many mathematical books since then that I would like to take to the beach. Anyway, I found this book fascinating, and I basically, in the year and a half I was there, I pretty much read the whole book. Um, and the one thing particularly struck me as interesting because I couldn't make sense of it. It was a very well-written book, but I didn't understand this particular comment that I thought was very intriguing. So I've highlighted it here. Um, again, this is a talk to a general audience, so I'm not going to try to say what this means. I just want to, or even what it says, I mean, time is going on, but there was a reference 
Anyway, to a paper by Dana Scott here. So I went to some effort to get this paper um, in order to find out what this means. And then I looked in it and I was very disappointed because it didn't contain anything that was explaining what was going on in, in this sentence. This particular paper um, referenced 1980 here, flagged, flagged, flagged at the top. Anyway, nevertheless, it, without the reference, what I'd understood was that one could do the following. One could, so we'd already talked about changing the axioms of set theory. Another thing you can do is change the logic of set theory rather than the axioms by weakening it and by giving up a very basic logical axiom. This is the logical axiom that says that something is either true or it's false. And this get, takes us into the realm of intuition, what's called intuitionistic logic. And again, when I first saw this, I thought this was a preposterous idea. How can it be the case that something's not either true or false? We don't have time to go into the ins and outs of that. Eventually, I appreciated that there's a great beauty to this subject. And what Dana Scott had shown was that, in fact, it allows you to give a, a simple set theoretic model of this untyped lambda calculus. So this equation we couldn't satisfy before, sorry, this is an equation, this means just these sets are in one-to-one -one correspondence, does indeed have models as long as one changes the logic of set theory. And it turned out, as I later found out when I was doing my PhD, that the, the problem was that there was simply a typo in the textbook. So the, the right reference wasn't Scott 1980, it was Scott 1980A, <laughs> which I would have had trouble getting my hands on in Trento anyway. So probably just as well, I didn't, I didn't know that. Anyway, so what can be done with this observation, um, or this fact of Scott's, and I actually spent quite a part of my research career not working in only on this, but developing this direction, and showing that by working with intuitionistic set theory, one can add an axiom which allows one to give sim simple, in a sense, set theoretic models, not just of the untyped lambda calculus, but of richer programming languages too. So, but we can ask the same questions as we asked before. Well, who wants to reason about these kind of programming languages? And the answer is, for the particular languages I was considering, is probably no one does. But the approach, nevertheless, potentially generalizes to other programming languages. So that wasn't the killer against this development. But there is, remained another question, well, this idea of giving up this logical axiom seems very perplexing when you first meet it. And it's too perplexing to most people. So who wants to reason in intuitionistic set theory? Who wants to give up this axiom? And be, it's, it's actually, people find it hard to avoid using the axiom without realizing that they, I mean, they can use the axiom without realizing that they're using it. So very few people actually are able to, to do this it, to, or, or willing to, to take this step. So actually, this was a line of work that in the end was going to be taken up by very few people, as I realized. So was this worthwhile? Well, it was in the sense it produced more general theorems about models of these programming languages than had been produced before. And I still believe that with the right evangelist at the helm able to educate enough people that one, it, it is, I think, probably, I think in the future it may well become a useful technique, particularly for automated reasoning, using this kind of intuitionistic logic to reason directly about programs. But never mind that, those are the sort of very, very speculative ideas about how it might be useful in practice. But one of the byproducts that is probably the, what I view as the more significant byproduct of this work was that actually it turned out that in order to do this work, one needed to develop a notion of model of, set the, of intuitionistic set theory that was not there in the literature. There was, at the time, it was very lucky, um, some mathematicians called André Joyal and Ika Murdike had just published a treatise on category, category theoretic models of set theory. And I realized that their models don't quite do what I needed. So I had to refine the models, and that led to um, what, what I think was a nice piece of work that has then had sort of influence on the development of that field. So really, although the work started, I was trying, I was really genuinely interested in trying to provide methods for reasoning in intuitionistic set theory about programming languages, probably the effect of the, 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 the best outcome of the work was a mathematical application to a certain class of models in mathematical logic. 
Right, well, time is nearly over, so I just want to end with, in fact, I'll say the whole thing. One speculation, it's just one slide about it, about another way in which one can vary the foundations of mathematics. We've seen we might change the axioms of set theory, we might change the logic of set theory, we also might change the language of set theory. And one way one can do that is um, one might want to talk about the following situation, that which arises in practice if you generate two real numbers independently and randomly, then it's the case that if you've got, if you're given one of the real numbers, you have no knowledge about the other real number. So there's a relation of independence between them. Knowing about one doesn't give you knowledge of the other, so you might call this epistemic independence. And it seems to me, from what I've been thinking about, that by extending the language of set theory with this relation of epistemic independence as a basic relation, one can obtain a very nice framework for developing probability theory based on entirely intuitive axioms in which none of the measure theoretic complications arise because every set has a measure. And this follows from intuitive principles about this notion of independence. And also probability enjoys an additivity, the, the additivity property that, for example, Matteo and I needed. And indeed it had, enjoys it for any cardinality, well, any alif, what's called an alif cardinality. I don't want to get too technical here, but the point of this is that these assumptions, the proof that Matteo and I did, well, it's Matteo's proof, but that, we, that I talked about earlier, the assumptions there, whereas before they had been assumed facts that weren't evident, under this approach, they actually become evident facts about, the, about this concept of epistemic independence. So it seems to me a very interesting line of development. Um, so that is my potential application to mathematics, basically to the foundations of probability theory. But the problem is that probability theory is hu hugely developed and hugely successful. And who really wants to revi revisit the foundations? I don't know, but it still seems to me an interesting intellectual program to carry this out. Anyway, I want to end with two quotations. So the first quotation um, is, is quite a famous quotation about mathematics by Charles Steinmetz. Mathematics is the most exact science and its conclusions are capable of absolute proof. But this is only because mathematics does not attempt to draw absolute conclusions. All mathematical truths are relative conditional. Now, I don't actually agree with this. Because I think that, for example, the proof that there are infinitely many primes is an absolute mathematical truth. But it has a degree of truth about it, where it, it is true, and what I've been trying to say in the talk is that one can reshape the foundation of mathematics by making different assumptions about the, the language, the logic, and the axioms. And these can, be done, these can have useful applications. Such reshapings can have useful applications. And um, so one can see then mathematical truths as being relative to the foundational theories within which they're developed. Anyway, there was also an undercurrent throughout the talk, and uh, that's but maybe it was picked up on it's my personal disapproval of the current political idea that the goal of research is ultimately to foster economic impact. So, in my view, computer scientists are developing new mathematics of interest and of general applicability, that the general areas are applicable. But one can't properly develop an area of mathematics, a new area of mathematics, by requiring that every component of the theory should have economic impact. Nor, in any case, does one maximise the economic return by restricting development only to those aspects that promise a short-term profit. So, I mean, generally, and probably I hope many people share these concerns, I always wonder at what point in history money went from being the servant of society to the master of society. So, I mean, surely it would be nice if we could decide the kind of society we wanted and use our economic strengths to enable that society to, to exist. So for me, and for many people, I think, pure research has an intellectual and cultural value that transcends its perceived economic return. And the last quote I want to end with is taken from a very nice book, which is about this um, 
well, uh, about the idea that universities should transcend their economic impact called What Universities Are For by Stefan Collini, which was published this year. I strongly recommend this book. And this is an old quote from an, an American academic from the 19th century. And I strongly believe this. I want to end with this. The place of a university in the culture, actually it said the culture of Christendom, but I thought I'd delete that, <laughs> is, as it has always been, a corporation for the cultivation and care of society's highest aspirations and ideals. So I'd like to end with that quotation. Well, I think I took a couple of things from that lecture that I'd like to share with you. One was how stimulating and how stressful it is to have really good PhD students. And as we saw in that photograph, Alex used to have dark hair, I used to have hair. Um, the other thing is actually a quotation by Feynman, which I, I really believe in, in terms of the last thing that you said. And he says, science is like sex. It may have an outcome and a product, but that's not the primary reason we do it. <laughs> okay. Now, Alex has kindly agreed to um, uh, answer some questions, so bearing in mind this is a general audience, is there anybody who'd like to ask uh, questions? No? When I, uh, sorry. This is just a comment to reinforce what you said. Last week, while Edinburgh was having its Turing Centennial, I was in Princeton, which was having its Turing Centennial. So I got exposed to um, learn a bit more about Turing and its history. Um, and of course, the reason, right, Lambda Calculus and what Turing did came along at the same time. Turing then went off to study with Church. And the reason Turing is the name we all know now, rather than Church, is because Turing, unlike Church, did a lot of philosophy. Right? And he sort of explained why the Turing machine ought to be the model of computation. And he explained why it ought to be universal, that you could write a program in the Turing machine that would simulate any other Turing machine. All, you know, who could think that this would be very useful, right? This, this is all deep in the foundations of mathematics, just like what you've shown us. Um, and in, but yet, very soon, people were building computers. And a lot of the people building computers said things like the following. Well, you'll never have a computer where you could have the same thing that was good for doing um, analytic equations and computing trajectories of missiles and useful for business purposes. You need separate ones for all of these. And this was at the same time that Turing and von Neumann, based on what Turing had done, had shown there's a universal machine that could do all of these. We would have eventually gotten to the universal machine, but probably would have taken an awful lot longer without, without what all these um, this fundamental work, or, or maybe even I'm exaggerating, right? Maybe we never would have gotten there. So th that shows just how to, abstruse philosophy can have huge practical impact. Yes, thanks very much, Phil, and I'm also relieved that's not even a question. So. <laughs> 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 Sorry? Just yes, okay, so <laughs> thanks. <yeah. laughs> well, let me ask you a question then. Do you believe that, I mean, although you as a theoretician may not actually need or wish to apply your research in the way that the um, government, in fact, rather than the research councils, to be fair, want us to. Do you believe that other people should be applying your research? Well, I be believe that people should be applying research, and I think, but I, th I think to get the best applicable research, one needs to also do the pure research as well as the research that you can see immediately now how it's going to be applied. And I also really do personally believe in the concept of the intellectual culture in a sense. I mean, a lot of mathematics is potentially not applicable, but it is still a, a high point of, of Western, and well, I'm sorry, not just of, of human culture. I was almost slipping into the Christendom there. <laughs> but a high point of, of, of human culture. And, you, you know, uh, it would be nice, you know, in spite of the economic crisis, as a culture, we're still relatively well off. And it would be 
nice if we could invest in our culture rather than in our profit. I think with that, we'll just um, uh, uh, thank Alex. I'll just finish with a comment there. I mean, when David Sainsbury was the Minister of Science, and of course he was uh, in the House of Lords, so he didn't have to be elected, he didn't have to satisfy the voters, he actually said to the research councils, it's your job to fund the fundamental research, it's other people's job to apply it. And I think that culture has actually uh, changed, but I think you know, many of us, certainly in mathematics, are, are still strongly in, in, in favour of that. I mean, with that, I'd like to pass over to uh, uh, the head of school and uh, Dave Robertson uh, to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, okay, so, uh, so uh, thanks, Alice. I'll keep, I'll keep this, th th this short. Uh, so, uh, uh, this was, for me, at least a, a very, I, I never used this word for a talk before, actually, this, this, was, this was a charming talk, and the reason it was charming was because uh, it, was, it, was, it was both humble, uh, 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 and also it, it really explained a lot of the kind of personal nature of how this stuff gets done. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I, I suspect, well, there, there are quite a few specialists actually in the audience, but there are also, also a few people uh, from a more, more general background. Uh, and and for, for those people, I, I'm pretty sure they didn't get all of, all of the details of your talk, uh, but, they probably did, uh, but they probably did understand the kind of main theme of it, but maybe, maybe not quite realized that it's, it's possible, that it's kind of under, understood it subliminally. Uh, and, I think, and for me, at least, that, that, that theme was that um, for for the, the fundamental part of, of computer science, which may be the bit that ultimately matters in the very, very long term, rather than the bit that we're doing because we need to make a bob or we need to actually make a difference to parts uh, of society, which in itself is actually quite a dignified profession. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But for that bit, the bit that you're talking about, it does really depend an awful lot on uh, a personal meeting of minds, and that's all you can really say about it. People scratch their heads for a long time, uh, an indeterminate period of time sometimes, um, uh, and just come up with a result. That's a very, very difficult thing to be able to explain to, uh, uh, to a research council. It's very difficult to defend, but one of the things that we do in this particular establishment is we do our best. Actually, you think I don't quite do my best, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but we, we try to do our best to, do, to defend that along with doing uh, the impact and the translational stuff that we, that we must also do because, because that's part of the, of the general duty. So thanks for uh, continually, I think, uh, reminding us uh, of that and, and long may you prosper in, in doing so. And I hope your worst prognoses about that uh, don't, don't work out. Thanks very much, Alex. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.